All right, how's everyone doing today? Uh, welcome to another uh, Wasabi Research Club meeting. Today we're talking about calf fusion part two. We're talking about the combinatorics because last week we talked about calf fusion protocol. And we have one of the authors with us, uh, John uh, uh, is with us uh, today. He'll answer questions in just a moment. Uh, okay. I mean, we had a bunch of resources because this was not a research. So just want to clarify that Ethan Hanman, uh, Yuval and Janald, uh, who Janald wrote a medium blog post about the, the naive coin join smart. Ethan brought up two attacks and nothing much actually brought up some attacks and or or you while uh, not sure how you would like <laughs> yourself to be called well anyway he, he brought up some attacks and 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 was was writing very long articles there <laughs> yeah. yes so there's a lot that's been said about the combinatorics and the privacy and security of the combinatorics uh um and so uh we'll be talking about that okay here's the paper you can find it on github and of course, this is where we're at with the research um, club. So uh, you can see here. Last week we did coin uh, cash shuffle or cash fusion the first time. Um, okay, um, we've been talking about coin shuffle and coin shuffle plus plus in the previous weeks, um, and these were mostly about equal output uh, coin joins. Um, uh, and we we had a problem that we 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 hit, which is that we want to be able to do arbitrary amounts. Um, so the problem is that when a user uses any coin join system that has a fixed amount, typically they get many, many coins. Um, later, they'll need to consolidate those uh, coins, um, an arbitrary number of those coins, without revealing input ownership, ideally, um, and thus hurting their privacy. So it would be great if we had a protocol that allowed for arbitrary outputs and arbitrary amounts. And last week, John talked a lot about how Cash Fusion um, allows a trustless and secure way for individuals to interact and create this arbitrary uh, input, arbitrary output uh, coin join um, by using a um, uh, pretty clever uh, trick with homomorphic uh, property of Peterson commitments, uh, Peterson commitments, um, and having all users input, uh, submit 23 input, output, uh, or blank um, um, values so they can have any number of inputs and outputs uh, or blanks uh, so long as the sum of those is not more than 23 or the sum should be exactly equal to 23. Um, and then other users can verify each other if the protocol does, uh, fails to, uh, to, to complete. So um, one question we can ask is, okay, well, the entire protocol allows for users to submit an arbitrary number of input outputs where the amounts can be within a certain range but aren't fixed, as is in the case of zero link. So how is it possible that we can't link inputs to outputs if there are no equal outputs like these other protocols? And so this is what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, we need to understand uh, two things, uh, the bell number of a set of elements and the subset sum problem. So I'll be going over those and then we'll go into questions uh, for um, the authors and uh, everyone else. So let's just take a, an example. Here are some inputs and outputs in what might be a cash fusion coin join. Uh, I'm purposefully doing a simple and small coin join. So a, a real cash fusion coin join is much, much larger, but uh, th this will illustrate the point uh, sufficiently. Um, so here is the actual breakdown. I've made it very simple. There are three participants, uh, red, orange, and yellow. And uh, if you do the math, you will see that uh, the amounts are exactly equal. We're not considering fees uh, at this moment. Um, but if you're just a passive bystander, this is what you see, right? You see a bunch of inputs, you see a bunch of outputs, and you, you have questions, right? Especially if you're a forensics company, you want to know um, what's going on here. Um, so the questions you might have are, for example, how many participants are really here? Because this is just one transaction, um, and it could be just one participant. That's what, you know, uh, a naive uh, onlooker might, might think. Um, but you, you're smarter than that. You know that there might be more than one participant in this coin join. And which input links to which output? Um, so one way you might do this is look at all the ways that the inputs can be grouped and all the ways the outputs can be grouped and try to find a value match. 
So, uh, so then the question arises, well, how many ways can we partition a set into smaller non-empty subsets? Uh, and as an example, let's just focus on the outputs because there are, are few, uh, fewer outputs than inputs. In this case, there are just six. So this seems to be quite a trivial problem. How many ways can we partition this set of six elements um, into subsets where there are no uh, empty subsets? Well, uh, an obvious um, solution is just, you know, what, what if one set is the entire set? Uh, that's obviously works, and that would be the case that uh, this uh, transaction uh, only uh, involved one individual. Um, we can also do uh, uh, set one and set two like this. Um, we could do it like this, where one set has three elements, another has two, and a third one has only one element. Um, and we don't care about the order of the subsets. We're really only concerned with distinct partitions. Uh, so how many ways can we rearrange these uh, subsets such that, again, um, uh, 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 their intersection is the original set? Uh, uh, excuse me, their union is the original set. For a set of six elements, um, there are a total of 203 ways to partition the set into subsets. Um, this might be a surprisingly large number. We're going to talk about that number in just a sec. So uh, the number of ways a set can be partitioned is called the Bell number. Um, and uh, we can observe uh, the Bell number as we increase the number of elements in our set. So obviously, if you have a set with one element, there's only one way to partition it, which is that very element and that's it. If you have two elements, you have two ways to partition. You could partition it so that it's, it's both elements, so that it's one element is in one set and one element is in the other, and so forth. And you can see that uh, the bell number uh, grows very quickly. Um, so by the time you get this to uh, a set of seven elements, you already have almost a thousand ways that they can be partitioned. And there's a recursive... Um, way that we can find the bell number of any n plus one, so long as we know the bell number of n, um, uh, of zero to n, and, and here it is. Um, and uh, what's more important to sort of understand is that the bell number uh, grows very, very quickly. Um, so uh, you see here on the right, there's an upper bound of, uh, uh, you know, of this equation with the, uh, um, with the, uh, with the fraction and, um, and 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 put simply, it's 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 roughly you know it's 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 less than n to the n. So it's a very very large uh, number. <laughs> um, and so, as an example, if you wanted to investigate a quantum with a hundred inputs, you would have to inspect this many possible combinations. So it's a very very large number, um, as, as you can tell. Um, so. Yeah, so we, we, we go back to our original coin join and we say, okay, well, how many possible subsets do we have to consider? Well, uh, over uh, on the right, we have our bell uh, number of six elements, which is 203. And on the left, we have our bell number of nine elements, which is 21,000. So you can see it's growing very quickly. And um, in a very simple way, this is, this is actually not true, uh, not the case, uh, we can simply try the 4 million, roughly 4 million uh, combinations of uh, subsets on the left and subsets on the right. The reason why this isn't true, why I put a little asterisk, is because uh, you don't want to try uh, an example where there are three sets on the left and two sets on the right, because that doesn't make sense. Uh, the number of sets on the left and the right must, must match. So it's smaller than 4 million, but as you can see, it's already quite large. Um, and the idea that uh, uh, the authors of, of Cash Fusion make, um, or the argument they make is that when you have a large number of participants with many inputs and many outputs, as an example, they, they said 10 participants with, with 10 inputs and 10 outputs each, um, you start to get into numbers that are just not practical for a forensics company to, to unravel. Um, and now we have to talk about the other problem, which is the subset sum problem. So given a set of numbers, is there a non-empty subset which whose sum is zero? Um, so on Wikipedia, you'll find something like this, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, negative three, negative four, negative eight. Um, and here are some examples of subsets uh, that add up to zero. Now with the coin joint example that we were looking at, we can just treat the right-hand side as negative, the left-hand side as positive, and we, we, we get back to this uh, this very problem. 
Um, so yeah, solving the subset sum problem. Um, so here's an example. You know, if I wanted to solve this problem, I just found right now uh, two inputs and an output that uh, exactly match um, um, to the same value. Uh, and I can do this many, many times. Um, and I could do it with a very uh, di different complexities. I could have many, many inputs, many outputs, or I could have just one input and one output. Um, and so the question we have to ask is, well, uh, what's the complexity? What's the runtime uh, for a computer to try to break uh, and investigate all of the input-output pairs? Um, and essentially it comes down to two parameters. Uh, and I pulled this directly from Wikipedia, so you'll read the same there. Um, essentially it comes down to N, the number of elements you need to investigate. So in our case, it's the number of inputs and outputs uh, and participants. And uh, further, P, the precision. Um, and so it turns out if you are less precise about uh, the sets matching, uh, then it's actually quite uh, uh, quite a bit faster. Um, so the goal for uh, hiding in this complexity with doing cache fusion is to create many inputs and outputs, so make a large N, and distort the precision of the input-output links, um, essentially having some sort of randomized fees, which is what uh, the authors um, uh, uh, mentioned in the paper as a good way to do... Uh, distort the, uh, the precision. Um, and so algorithms for solving this subset sum run in exponential time, which again is what we're looking for for um, hiding in, uh, in, in complexity, right? We want, we want something that gets incredibly complex um, uh, the more participants join. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's pretty much uh, the, 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 the very basics. I will say a few things and make a few points later on. Um, but that's pretty much everything I wanted to share um, to get us uh, going. So I'll, I'll open it to John, I'll, uh, maybe to say something, and then uh, questions. <clears throat> yeah, that was a good summary. Um, yeah, so just a disclaimer, I'm like not a mathematician. <laughs> but uh, I, I encountered this bell number when I was just trying to research this a little bit. There's a lot of great math stuff on Wikipedia. Um, anyway, so yeah, as you as you pointed out, um, it's it's not like exactly a bell number. Like like theoretically, you could have a bell number for the inputs, like the number of partitions, and then multiply that by the by the outputs. Uh, but then, as you mentioned, like it, it it wouldn't necessarily be the same number of um, of groups <clears throat> in that partition. So there's a, a kind of number called a Stirling number, which is related to the Bell numbers. <clears throat> Basically, a Bell number is like you're, you're summing all the Stirling numbers over over some range. So the way I thought to to really calculate it would be to like start with start with the number one, like one group. And so the number of ways you can divide like 50 outputs into one group is going to be just one. And so you would multiply that uh, by the number of um, by the number of partitions that have one group on the outputs. Then you go to two, and so you, you ask like, how many ways can you partition this group of 50 inputs into two groups, and so on. And you just keep going up until you've reached either the number of inputs or the number of outputs. And, and, and so you get all those um, products, and then you just add them all together. Uh, but it's very similar to a dull number. So yeah, <laughs> and then like what? And then basically what? What what the math and the paper is based on is is basically like comparing that number of partitions to um, like the number of possible values you'd have in the in the space, quote unquote. So, for example, let's just say that your the, the maximum value out of any input or, or sum of inputs is going to be like. 10 bitcoins or, or 10 bitcoin cash so that's that's 1 billion satoshis and so if you have like nine players um then instead of like 10 to the nine it's really like 10 to the nine times nine which is 10 to the 81 <clears throat> and actually you can take away one of the players because the the last player will just kind of have the leftovers kind of like by default so you end up with like eight uh 10 times uh or sorry, 10 to the 8 times 9, which is 10 to the 72. So that's kind of like where those numbers come from. It's like you're comparing like 10 to the 90th versus 10 to the 70th. And so the all these numbers are huge, but the the, the number of partitions is like orders of magnitude bigger. So 
like on a probabilistic level, you're you're bound to end up with a bunch of valid partitions. And then there's a second way that I analyzed it, which which I wrote another article on, which is <clears throat> kind of a more straightforward approach. Like let's start with player one, have him select ten of the uh, ten of the inputs and outputs, and so he'll get like an n choose k number, and then you go on to the next player. And, but instead of choosing from like 100 inputs, he'll only have 90 to choose from. And you can do it that way also. And it's sort of also, you end up with the same conclusion that it's, you know, given the right size of the, you know, the number of players and, and the precision of the inputs and the outputs, um, there's going to be, it's, it's basically private in this way. Thank you. Um, before going on to specific points, I'd like to give an opportunity to Ethan and nothing much to, to to comment on what what happened what what they heard so far so maybe let's start with Ethan um, do you have any thoughts or comments so far yeah I guess um, one thing that I'm kind of curious about is it seems like these um, numbers uh, are are very large um, but these seem like worst case analyses um, for instance you could imagine a um, some subset problem that's actually like really easy um, because the values chosen are just like, they, it just like works out nicely. Um, so like one of the problems that people have had when trying to use the knapsack problem for cryptography is a knapsack problem is hard sometimes, but most of the time it's easy. Um, and so it seems to me like some of these coin joins may provide um, privacy and some of them may provide not privacy or less privacy. And I, I wonder how you think about that gap between the like the worst case numbers um, and the 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 like um, best case where it is like trivial to solve just because of the numbers that are chosen. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't have like a like a simple answer, but but you are correct. Like we just saw, for example, I think it was last night, there was this awesome looking uh, transaction with like 100 inputs and like 20 outputs. But then there was one input, I, for, I forget, it was either one input or one output, or maybe both that was like really big. Like, um, like it was like eight BCH when all the other ones were like one BCH output. So obviously that one, that one sticks out like a sore thumb. So that, that's kind of one example of the kind of uh, thing you're talking about. And, and maybe there's others as well. Um, I think what we could do at some point is, is to try to put in uh, what I call a sanity check, just like a, some kind of filter where you're looking for outliers and stuff. And so I think the outliers is one thing. And maybe there's, like I said, maybe there's other uh, scenarios where it's not really, where the numbers are whacked in a, in a way that kind of messes it up. Yeah, you know, and I, I think about this in, in equal value coin joints, right? There is there there is no discrepancy here, right? So so that would be zero. But then, if you increase the range of uh, of real values of these UTXOs that you have, uh, and it's it's more volatile. For example, in between a corridor of one point one Bitcoin and zero point nine Bitcoin, right? In in this corridor, plus minus ten percent around zero point one bit or around one Bitcoin. Um, you you can have a range, or you know this this range increases then to plus minus two hundred percent or whatever. Can we find some method to calculate where this line of uh, you know range between the amounts uh, shall be set? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> it's it's a tough question. The th the thing with it, even if you have like a a value that's, let's say, more than twice as big as the others, I mean, it still could be hard to figure out, like, you know, if you have 100 inputs, there could be many ways to get that to get that large output. Um, so, yeah, these are good questions and hard questions, I think. And I, I think we would probably find that as the range expands away from the equal output, um, uh, it, it reduces anonymity. Uh, one thing uh, I want to bring up is that uh, Knapsack was actually um, one of, uh, of the few candidates for a one-way function. 
Um, I'm, I'm just reading here in the Merkel Hellman knapsack crypto system, but it was later rejected. Uh, that's an interesting thing because in that crypto system, uh, uh, the users, uh, uh, the, 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 the user that wanted to encrypt the data chose the uh, elements in the knapsack. Um, so that means he or she could have chosen the absolutely the best elements to hide and mask um, the subset sum problem. And um, it was still rejected. So th this to me seems like a red flag. I'm just curious what, what Ethan uh, would say about that. So I don't I don't know much about the actual uh, knapsack crypto problem um, that that particular crypto system I know it's been proposed a number of times um, and I think generally my understanding of it is the the problem is that it is not of equal hardness so I might choose a, a key or some secret value that I think is is hard um, but then later it turns out not to be hard. Um, so you, usually when you build crypto systems, you want something where the keys are all a randomly chosen key has the same strength as another randomly chosen key. Um, and a lot of the sort of like uh, NP problems have trivial cases. Um, and uh, you may not always know whether you've chosen a trivial case or not. Right. But, uh, you know, j j just to take a look uh, at this, we see that uh, they choose a super increasing sequence of elements such that you know the next element is always the sum of all the previous elements this is ideal for hiding in a knapsack because you have a lot of possible uh, uh numbers you can swap for other numbers and it's obvious which numbers you can swap for other numbers um and even then it it, it, it was rejected um so it seems uh, quite um gloomy for us if we aren't able to you know hand pick uh um, the, the inputs and outputs we want to we want to hide in. I guess if if no is going to pick it up, then uh, I might as well say my my bit. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to apologize. I'm a bit sick and more scatterbrained and cranky than usual, so I didn't uh, really prepare properly. Um, and. I have a, a slight correction to Napara, which is that I did not uh, like uh, uh, talk about any attack about cash fusion in particular. Um, more generally, about this same problem of of assuming um, that th this is uh, like a valid hardness assumption from a cryptographic standpoint. Like interpreting the Bell numbers um, as security parameters seems uh, sketchy to me for these reasons. Um, and it seems more sketchy to me uh, also because I think subset sum is the wrong framing for this. Um, I mean, it's more like, uh, I think technically it's the N partition problem and um, uh, subset sum is a search problem, uh, but really in the uh, N partition problem is also a search problem, but from like a chain analysis adversary point of view, um, Really, it's it's more of an optimization problem. It's that uh, maybe they only care about one participant, or maybe they uh, only uh, need approximate answers. Um, so I think it's very uh, important to distinguish between the uh, number number of plausible interpretations uh, for a coin join transaction. For the the equal amount case, it's it's trivial. Uh, it's literally just the bell number. Um, but in in other cases, it, it seems like a, a very optimistic kind of assumption uh, to to like analyze the search space invalid uh, mappings uh, from using the the knapsack uh, terminology um, because that number is. Um, might not be relevant at all. Uh, maybe because they're using, you know, a, a better approximate techniques. For example, linear programming is pretty effective uh, at, at giving a, a good enough but not perfect solutions to this. Um, so so to, to that is... Note, here is the James Vogue, one of the resources for uh, this research club, was actually using linear programming uh, and he still could not not uh, do anything with it so 
Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the point I was getting to. By the way, I, I used it as well for the still yet unfinished shame uh, uh, research that I did on on Wasabi uh, to identify uh, change. So it, it's a pretty effective technique. I mean, even for Wasabi size uh, coin joins, uh, when you have the constraints set up right, um, the system like pulp with uh, I don't remember. I think I used the uh, coin or solver. Um, Whenever it was not buggy, it, it was under a second to come up with an assignment that, that's unique for the, the change values, uh, even accounting for all of the stuff that uh, the Wasabi coordinator does with fee discounts and so on and so forth. So um, even for fairly large problems where N is uh, large, um, uh, in practice, I think um, treating the, the space of invalid options is, is a dangerous assumption. Uh, and what uh, James's article uh, showed was um, basically uh, there's more than one solution. And, and I think that that's the number that we are really interested in as far as uh, the privacy gains. Um, because mm -hmm. that's, that's not something that you can decide uh, a priori, which of the valid solutions are correct. Once you've enumerated a set of solutions, uh, if that set is uh, sufficiently large that it uh, confers um, plausible deniability to the participants, then I think the coin join assumptions work. So um, to me, kind of um, uh, like that, that is the, that was the main point of, of my email. And it was not, um, you know, with respect to cash fusion, but more generally about knapsack and, and cash fusion. I, I just want to uh, jump in on that um, idea that the number of solutions is the privacy gained. Um, because uh, with Tumblebit, when using Tumblebit as a payment hub, um, that is uh, exactly the privacy definition we get. Like um, any, 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 the privacy is the number of uh, ways that this input and output relationship can be satisfied. Um, I, I think that that's like a, a really good way of looking at it. And that, that's not to say that adding additional difficulty for the adversary is bad. I, I think it's great to make it computationally harder. I mean, I really struggled to write that linear programming stuff because of all the idiosyncrasies in Wasabi, and I'm still not done. There's still bugs. So in a sense, it's effective, but it's not a robust security assumption, I think. All right. So, so far, we talked about computational hardness. Um, one thing before we move on to the actual number of valid partitions, uh, I just want to address something, but because on the Bitcoin dev mailing list, uh, many people can be the Wasabi example, uh, j just just like you now, but the Wasabi example is bad because we have coin selection that's very public. So if I look at inputs in a Wasabi transaction, then I, if I find an input that is larger than the base den denomination, then I'm not going to try to find all the different partitions these inputs can be combined together in order to find the change. But no, I'm going to say, hey, this input is its own partition. I'm looking for the change for this specific input. And usually that's going to be right unless this was a test transaction by me. There were some some strangenesses there but uh, you, you see there there are very very simple heuristics how to get the change back because there are rules that wasabi follows and and that can be used for for analyzing it yeah I mean, th that's exactly what i did um i i did not attempt to analyze the uh mix outputs only the change outputs uh but that that's still a large n um, and in principle, by specifying as a linear constraints problem, um, the search space is the entire thing. Uh, so I, I think that, that there's a, a, what the knapsack paper basically did is uh, it proposed a way of, by construction, always having some plausible deniability. And my understanding of cash fusion is that it kind of achieves the same plausible deniability as James Vaughn's uh, uh, article showed. Uh, stochastically, in the sense that given the uh, amounts are quite similar and there's randomization and in many inputs, there's a very high probability that there's going to be plausible deniability. Uh, but I think that's very distinct from uh, the computational hardness of actually uh, like putting assignments in there. Um, 
Yeah, all right. Let, let's move on to that because that's the that's the huge contribution of of this because no one actually ever thought about, as far as I know, the Knopfsack paper introduced the computational hardness idea, but no one thought about oh, there are actually very accidental valid submappings, uh, and how does that make sense? Now, I there is an intuition that I heard from. Uh, John Ald, and this is the birthday problem, right? Uh, which actually, John Ald, would you, would you like to explain the birthday problem uh, and how this can be, this intuition can be applied to the to the valid combinations? Maybe. Yeah, I, I forget where it came up in in which conversation, but it's just, I guess, the birthday paradox is kind of just an example of how sometimes math can be a little bit counterintuitive and you don't expect like, Oh, 23 people in a room. What, you know, there's like a, it doesn't sound like that many people. Right. So that's when you hear that, Oh, there's a 50, 50 chance that someone's going to have the same birthday. You kind of scratch your head and say, wait a sec, does that make any sense? And so the same thing, kind of the same kind of counterintuitive uh, property seems to apply that here. Also, when you look at um, like, it's surprising how many different ways um, that that things can add up to the same sums. So there's a there's a piece of code that Mark wrote, which which kind of does like I, I just call it mini cash fusion, where he's just taking um, three players that each have six in uh, inputs, um, like, and each of them are kind of like they're they're pretty small, like 150 or 400 or something, and then and you you run the code and it's like oh there's like 60 ways that these could all add up and it just seems like like really counterintuitive and like for me i had to like just check a few of them like wow okay that adds up like so you get all the you get a lot more um things that sum up than you, than you would really think i i have a question um when we talk about plausible deniability are we saying that um that three possible uh, input-output relationships um, uh, uh, like can be satisfied work, um, or are we saying that they are equally um, likely? Like, you, like one could imagine that you have three different ways of doing it, but based on the spend distributions, one of the ways is like, you know, ninety-eight percent of the time, and then the other two ways are like one percent of the time. Um. Why would the why would some of them be only one percent versus one of them is like ninety percent? So if you imagine that um, the number of inputs coming into a transaction is like drawn from a um, some sort of uh, random function, um, if that random function is not like uniform, most people might only contribute three inputs. So five inputs is like less likely. Uh, um, so. Yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I, I don't know. Um, I think, uh, I mean, if you look, if, if I look at, at my wallet right now, like some of the, some of the cash fusions have like, um, like, you know, three or four inputs, some of them have nine inputs. So it's, I think it's, I don't know if that's going to be too much of a factor. Um, I just wanted to make, I wanted to make a couple other comments on some of the things you guys were saying. Um, I, I forget who said it, but I agree that the like the math and cash fusion is not exactly the the su the subset sum problem, and it, it's not exactly the partition problem either. It's kind of related to both of them, but it's slightly different. Um, I think it's kind of it gets into like maybe what some people will call like additive combinatorics, which I don't. So I don't think there's like a clear. I don't think anyone's really solved the math in like a rigorous way. <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanted to say is as far as the James Waugh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, his, his paper is really interesting. Um, but I, like to me, it just basically all it really proves is that it's not broken in, in a trivial way. So what he's doing is like just coming up with one possible set of inputs and outputs and then looking at all the other inputs and kind of proving that they could at least exist in some other um, in some other sum, but he's not 
he's not showing that they're all like adding up at the same time. So he's kind of taking a slice, you know what I mean? Which is cool, but it's not really like proving anything one way or the other. Uh, I I interpreted it as concrete proof of. Uh, so f- first of all, to clarify, I use plausible deniability in the weaker sense of not assuming any prior knowledge and only considering a single transaction in isolation. Uh, and within that kind of uh, like the way I interpreted his article is that uh, even when you apply uh, linear programming to cash fusion transactions, um, if you add if you get a solution out of the solver and then add a constraint that says it must not be that solution, additional solutions exist. And that, that's just a standard technique for enumerating the, the set of solutions. Um, and, and to me, the point of it was, uh, even though the hardness assumption um, might not be robust in the sense of um, like interpreting the, the anonymity gained as proportional to the bell number, uh, you still end up with um, uh, that like fundamental level of um, uh, uh, ambiguity because multiple solutions exist. So um, I, I, I understood like that to be a, a pretty strong statement about um, uh, he, he didn't analyze like how it came to be that there were multiple solutions, but um, um, I, I thought it was. Um, it, completely independent solutions based on my understanding of, of his article. Well, he, he was showing that if you, if you have like one, um, like out of a whole trend, this whole huge uh, fusion transaction, if you like select some inputs and some outputs, um, he proved that the other inputs, uh, like it's not unique. Like those, those inputs could be in some other, some, but he didn't really show that that both of those would exist at the same time. That's that's kind of how I saw it. So it's it is like valuable to show it's not trivially broken, but it's also not like a rigorous proof that it's you know that it's secure. Uh, specifically, the passage I'm referring to. Uh, so he says uh, to check this, we can rerun the integer programming solver to try and find a match that is distinct from the match that we have already found that must include this value. Um, but when he said match, he's not talking about the whole transaction. He's just talking about one player, as far as I understood it. Uh, but that that implies that there's uh, like st- at least two valid interpretations based just on the information inside of the transaction. So I think that that's a pretty uh, good finding in the sense that, um, like. Y- 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 I, I don't think it's uh, any weaker just because he's focusing on uh, one res- like one match. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I actually don't know that much about linear programming, um, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Pretty cool how we how we coded that. I, I have a I have a question about the privacy model. Um, it, is the assumption that the um, tumbler or the party uh, constructing the coin join the coordinator um, does it know uh, how many outputs um, are assigned to a user? So does it know that like um, three of these outputs are uh, the same user and two of these outputs are a different user? It might not know the the input output relationships, but does it know the groupings? Um, or does it know like this was constructed by three users, but it doesn't know how many of those three users are there? Um, and if that isn't in the privacy model, um, if that isn't assumed, like what's the network security to sort of hide that from the from the um, like coordinator party that's producing the coin join? So the the server could find out how many players are in a fusion, but it doesn't know like how many outputs or inputs there are, like per user. Does that answer it? Yeah, I'm just like, how does it, so I guess, all right, so it knows how many are there. So the the probability, the um, the analysis, like if, if we say we have plausible deniability, but one of those paths is like, um, uh, assumes eight users and we know that it's nine users, do we still have plausible deniability? Like, is there sort of a little bit of trust that's placed in the tumbler not to reveal that information? 
Oh, and all the users know this information too, I believe. Uh, no, no, the, the, user, the users don't know. Um, actually, it's no, the users don't know. I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but is is there not something with the index number uh, in the blame phase uh, to which of the uh, w which of the users you randomly assign an index number? I believe for that. Uh, but I, that, that's it's not player based; it's just the input. So when in the blame phase, you you know the player is verifying one of the inputs or one of the outputs, um, but the the players don't know how many other players exactly are are in the in the round. The server could know because uh, because it has the list of commitments from each player. Um, but as far as like um, trying to like use that information to get a better understanding of the combinatorics. Um, I think it would probably only have a limited value, a limited, like, um, you, you could, like, if you're doing the, the math based on Serling numbers, it would narrow it down. Like, if you knew there was eight, eight players exactly, then it would just be, it would be, like, the Sterling number of, like, eight, um, or, like, let's say, 50 inputs, then you'd basically be asking how many partitions are there with exactly eight groups um, of 50 inputs, and then the same thing for the outputs. So it would definitely um, decrease the number of valid partitions if you knew that. But, but, but only the server knows that, actually. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, I want to go back for a while when, when Ethan said something, because I think that was very important and we kind of m missed it, that, uh, you know, what really matters is not the number of partitions but <clears throat> how well the links are broken so the NOPSAC paper actually gave a mathematical model of, of, of uh, analyzing coin joins uh, in terms of so if you take all the valid partitions and then you look at input 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 output and output output links, which would mean that, for example, you take two inputs and you see how many valid partitions there are compared to the total number of valid partitions. And that's how strongly the link is broken. So I think when someone will investigate this problem further, then that would be a very very useful thing to actually look at and try to try to analyze it because if it turns out that that the valid partitions are usually uh, the if it turns out that that there are much more valid partitions for a, for a real link then that's going to be the assumed transaction there i ho i hope it it was uh, understandable what i said You, you lost me a little bit. Are you saying that it's it's all about just like finding the number of of valid partitions and not necessarily the total number of partitions? If I register two inputs together uh, and no one knows these two inputs are together, but I register them together and then they find all the valid partitions of the coin join and then they find that that there are ten valid partitions, but out of that 10, nine valid partitions actually partitions together my two inputs. Right, right. Yeah. So that's something to... But that's almost as hard as like trying to, trying to solve the basic problem anyway. It's like you're trying to, you have so many partitions <laughs> that it's really hard to, to get that data. I mean, that's, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that it is because... Uh, I mean, again, you, you have uh, uh, you can't solve the partition problem in the general case uh, in less than exponential time, but uh, for special cases, uh, you often can. Um, and I think that this is this is also a weakness of uh, the um, like the samurai Boltzmann um, uh, entropy measure. Um, I, I think that that's another very important distinction I want to. Draws like the um, privacy 
from the point of view of an individual user. So how much plausible deniability am I gaining by participating in a coin join of some form uh, versus, uh, I guess, uh, technical fungibility would be the, the way to frame it. Uh, that is, um, how much does this transaction, um, uh, how much ambiguity overall does this transaction create um, from a, a public point of view? And I think that those are... Um, very distinct analyses because um, for uh, privacy, you care um, about whether or not people are targeting you. And um, in, in those circumstances, it's also plausible that they're going to use um, additional information like uh, network level privacy leaks. Um, uh, they're going to look at the transaction graph as a whole and they don't really care about uh, looking at the parts of the transactions that maybe you participated in that don't pertain to that data. So th there's many ways to uh, prune that search space. And, um, and uh, secondly, maybe they don't even care um, about, like all they want to prove is, um, you know, it, it, th that, uh, you had at least this much money that flowed through some some something, right? Um, that's, I think, a, a very different analysis than uh, the the public level privacy, which is what m most of these um, analyses kind of, of kind of look at. Um, did did that make sense? Yeah, it's an interesting points. Um, yeah, you're talking about like using other, like you said, net, network level. There could be timing things. Um, yeah, there's like different ways that people could try to uh, try to break the privacy. But uh, yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting. Um, it, it brings up the discussion of of like you know how much privacy do we need, or maybe it's good to like not have like too much, like maybe not have you know like in Bitcoin Cash like. We don't necessarily want to become Monero, for example. Um, so may maybe there's like a good balance where a coin can have like good privacy for everyday users and still not be like, I don't know, like, be, like not uh, go too far on the side of privacy where the regulators hate it. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, even in Monero's case, if you have some requirement, you can always prove what you actually did. So... Um, th th that's not the distinction I'm trying to draw. Rather, um, that there, if we assume that privacy and fungibility are a net good, um, analyzing the risk or uncertainty with respect to either um, feels very different to me. Because for the case of one user trying to uh, hide from uh, an adversary that sees everything, um, a lot of these guarantees that make sense in kind of the public context become much weaker in, in like a single user context. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I, 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 it's like, you can look at the average, you can imagine a coin join that provides very good average privacy, but always robs one user of privacy. Um, and so if you just look at that average, you're like, Oh, it's providing a lot of privacy. But if you're that one user, you get no privacy from it. Um, so I, I think, yeah, like, what is the minimum privacy provided to each user, um, right, rather than, like, the average privacy provided? Um, yeah, that, that's the point I was trying to make. If, if we go back to um, that example where there's, like, two inputs, um, e even if you group them together, that doesn't necessarily tell you what the outputs are. So maybe that that's kind of part of the conversation of the minimum. Can you so, rephrase that? I didn't quite well, understand. I'm, saying, I'm just saying, like, even if you even if you somehow were able to determine that there was some inputs that are likely to belong to the same person, th that doesn't necessarily tell you which outputs they got, right? I, I think though in that scenario, it was like there are um, 10 valid ways um, for this uh, coin join to work. Um, and in nine of them, um, this set of two inputs matches some other set of three outputs. Um, and then in and then there's only one other case where that set of inputs matches another set of outputs. 
So if you were to assume that these inputs and outputs were selected uh, randomly, there is only a 10% chance that it points one place and there is a 90% chance of a particular input output relationship for a particular user. Oh, that's actually the exact same problem. That's the largest input, largest output attack. What you you mentioned, Jana, which was uh, which was what someone come with one thousand, and everyone else comes with around one, right? So one thousand in, and I don't know nine hundred out. That can be only that because in every valid sub mapping of the coin join that large input will always connect to that large output. Right. But but it, it, in the case where we're not talking about like those kind of outliers, I mean, like, how would you, how would you solve this? How would you, how would you get insights into which are the, which inputs go together? So I, I, I don't know how you would get um, insights, like in the largest value one, it's like pretty obvious. Um, but there might be some uh, less less obvious approaches. Um, but I think that the right metric to use to measure the amount of privacy is to look at the the guessing entropy. That is, if you sorted all the possible input output valid input output relationships from um, most likely to least likely, and you started guessing from uh, most likely, how many guesses would you need before you got to the correct answer? Like on, on average. But there's multiple correct answers, right? There's multiple correct answers, but some of the correct answers are more likely to be correct than other ones. Mm. Like in the nine versus one example, one user gets an anonymity set size two and the other user gets, uh, or the other users get uh, much higher values. Right. Yeah, so there are low, low, low value users and high value users, and even if they put the money into the same coin join, the their low and high value users are going to end up in the same sub mappings in every every valid sub mapping of the coin joins, or, or most of them. That that would be. It, it'll be interesting to see what people come up with. Uh... You know, some some actual mathematicians maybe <laughs> will publish a paper and see. Uh, maybe we'll see some more insights into the heuristics and, and techniques like that, that could be used to uh, to try to break it. How, how would this change if we have a combination of unequal and equal uh, output in one transaction? Basically, something like what Wasabi is doing right now, right? You have the equal value and you have change, but differing from this current model. Uh, to remove this restriction on, on the number of inputs and outputs. So basically say that any one user must have at least one input and at least one output, but there is no upper bound basically with, within some, some, uh, some reason. Um, and then you don't know if one user has uh, only unequal amounts or if he also has equal amount coins. Uh, and how would this change the, the possible uh, set? Well, already you can have multiple. I mean, you can, uh, as far as the second part of what you said, like there's no, you know, the only thing is there's 23 is the maximum total of inputs plus outputs. So you could have one input, one output, but you can also have more inputs or or, more outputs. Um, But then as far as having some of the outputs be the same value, um it's kind of interesting and I, that's i never thought about that but maybe it's maybe that could improve it so here is a thought i wanted to bring up later but now we are on topic that if we would want to to use cash fusion as it is then without cash shuffle or, or without any kind of mixing before then you would still have to break uh, coins into two or three or four parts anyway, don't you? Because it's like users don't have, like only users who would have a lot of volume and incoming and outgoing money would be able to actually participate with multiple inputs and outputs. So I I think some kind of uh, amount splitting would be necessary 
in order to to keep the thing flowing um, do you have any think is that something I miss am i on on the right path on this thinking yeah i mean that's that's the that's the whole benefit of like the unequal amounts so you don't need to worry about splitting things and 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 trying to like prepare the utxos you can just kind of fuse with whatever coins came from the, the last fusion or or whatever you have so it's yeah kind of more practical uh, there, there is a dif difference there because in unequal amount you cannot split that's the rule here uh, you would split and you would gain privacy but you would have the you could still decide to not split it so uh, that's that's why it's interesting yeah all, all this stuff is, <laughs> is pretty interesting i think yeah okay anyway let's move on to to there are three attacks that i i wrote to myself and one is we talked about the largest input largest output the other two is is ethan's attack actually but uh, for before going into ethan's attack uh anyone has any idea how to mitigate the largest input largest output attack Well, like I was saying earlier, if there's a, if there's some kind of a sanity check on the server before it it proceeds, if if there's an outlier where it's some huge value that's that's an order of magnitude beyond everything else, it could just maybe the round just gets aborted or something. Yes, and I think that the well, what is described in the paper with this tier size uh, or, or pool registry is, I think, very interesting because here then we can use different pools to see who is waiting for, for doing a coin join. And then as soon as a certain anon set is reached, that specific tier range of, let's say, one Bitcoin plus minus 10% uh, gets done. Right? And maybe the, the lower the range is, maybe 10 Bitcoin plus minus 1%, Right, the, the more possible submappings uh, would be valid. So how would you define the outlier? Uh, my thinking is that it is larger than the sum of all the other inputs. So there is an output that's larger than the sum of all the other inputs, but there might be some more <laughs> restriction needed there. So it sounds like a sensible upper bound at least, right? Yeah. By the way, th these other attacks, where can I read about them? I haven't, I haven't, uh, you said that Ethan published a couple of attacks. Where, where can we find those? So it is on the Wasabi Research Club. It is pointing to the Bitcoin dev mailing list and there were some discussion and uh, and that's it. Uh, and oh, okay, so so one of the attack is the precision attack. Ethan, could you describe it? Sure. So I should I should preface my um, statement by um, uh, the 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 stuff that I read through on CoinFusion wasn't very specific on how it worked. So I made some um, assumptions about how it worked. Um, those assumptions may not be correct. Um, so the the first attack was assuming that. We allow um, uh, inputs of arbitrary precision, um, and uh, looking at um, let's see, so looking at um, the precision of the outputs, where um, you can you could infer based on say like this having a whole bunch of decimal places um, out that it could only be. Um, or that it was more likely that it was from a particular input. So like if you had an input that was like 1.0000001, um, and then you had an output that also had like, like that was like, you know, 0 0.50001, um, if the, uh, it's probably likely that that one that's all the way out to the right uh, matches in the output matches to that input. Um, uh, so I, I, I looked at that, um, if you just allow arbitrary um, arbitrary precision, um, especially if you're doing wallets, where some of the wallets may not actually allow you to do outputs of arbitrary precision. Um, 
I don't know if this is a problem in Bitcoin, but I know in Ethereum, um, there uh, people sometimes don't let you do beyond a certain level of precision. So you might have wallets where some wallets are only producing input outputs with a certain level of precision, and then other wallets are producing input output relationships with a um, uh, a higher level of precision. Um, so this could th this could be a heuristic that would allow you to identify input output relationships. I don't know if that made made any sense. It, uh, just to be clear, um, it's it's a good uh, attack vector, except if there's any randomization in the fees, um, it would distort any minute differences in the in the you know eighth and seventh and sixth decimal points. Um, so that's just my, I'm guessing that's what John would, would would say as well. Yeah, I agree. It's easy to mitigate. Uh, th there are other ways to. Yeah, I mean, that's we're, we're already doing, I think, just a trivial amount, I think, like up to 10 Satoshis of randomness with the fees. But we could add more, and we could also add, like, just kind of, like, I think Mark calls it quantizing, just, just kind of brute forcing, like, just chopping off a, a decimal to make it just have less precision in the outputs. It just makes it a lot harder to um, to have unique ways to add up. Or, or it makes there more possibilities for different combinations to add up. Yeah, you see, in these mixing protocols, you can always opt to let, let's let's take one percent fee from everyone, and that fee would be some some gambling there that to make 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 outputs somehow equal or something like that. That would be the 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 point of the piece so th there are there are interesting things there ethan uh, do you agree that it's easy to mitigate um we can um, move on i i think that the 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 mitigation described um uh like breaks my attack um but i'm not sure that there isn't a more advanced attack um and it really depends how you do these like fees um because if you're you know, like if the if the fees were only to a certain level of uh, precision, and the um, and the output was uh, the 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 precision that someone produced an output in was like greater than the fees. So I, I think it really depends on the um, on how exactly these mitigations work. Um, when I wrote that attack, uh, as 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 I said before, um, I wasn't sure on some of the details of how the protocol worked. So I was just assuming um, arbitrary. I was. I assumed two cases: either arbitrary precision or um, fixed precision, and then I looked at attacks against both of them. But I did not consider the case in which you are like randomly subtracting fees, which is a is a is a really interesting approach. But I, I kind of I need to think about it more to understand um, uh, how whether it it fully mitigates it. But it does mitigate the like sort of toy attack I posted about. By the way, I I think I. A slightly more robust mitigation would be to uh, not just add fuzzing, but also restrict um, the Hamming weight or something proportional to the product of the Hamming weight, which is just the number of one bits in or the, the number of symbols needed to represent an amount um, times the difference between the uh, largest figure and the smallest figure, uh, because that, that gives you... Um, I, I, the, the formula is just off the top of my head. Please don't take it literally. But the idea there being uh, the more, uh, the, the larger the Hamming weight of an amount, the more uh, signal there is in there. Um, so th that, that's a very um, simple approach to kind of reduce the uh, ability of uh, the adversary to um, uh, interpret the, the different bits in the, the amounts as uh, related or not related to each other. Right. Maybe you can what, what, what hamming is, because I'm not really that, I've heard it before and I've seen it. But so uh, it's the uh, number of uh, symbols required to represent uh, a code word. Um, and in the context of amounts, uh, you can just think of it as the number of one bits, uh, given that the alphabet is like binary digits. And, um, and so, so uh, for example, if you represent a power of two uh, of Satoshis, that's going to be 
uh, Hamming weight of one, uh, whereas like a high precision value with many digits in it, uh, that's going to have uh, a much higher Hamming weight. Okay, so it sounds very related to just how many decimal precision the upper column. I, I think that that's one aspect, but also the the other aspect is um, within that range of precision, uh, how much information is in that amount? Like, um, like it, it could be a very precise amount in the sense that there's a very large difference between the most significant digit and the least significant digit. But if uh, those are the only two digits, then you only need a very minute amount of fuzzing so long as for the most significant digit, uh, you have uh, plausible deniability because of the other participants, right? That That's, um, right, assume that there is a, everybody is on the same tier, therefore everybody's uh, uh, amounts are within the same order of magnitude that confers plausible deniability to the most significant digits uh, and fuzzing confers plausible deniability to the least significant digits but you know for larger amounts there's a disincentive to enable it um, but if you restrict the number of digits that appear in the middle of the range um, uh, then you only need a small amount of fuzzing to um, basically make it so that that information is, is kind of useless to anybody doing this sort of analysis. Did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish Mark was on this call cause I'm sure he'd get a lot, a lot from that. I think you know, as, as we go on um, evolving this thing, there'll, there'll be lots of things we can, we can add in to try to improve um, just like the, the consistency of, of getting quality fusions that, um, that are all more, you know, or th th that are more private in general. So yeah, maybe we can, we can use some of those techniques to, um, to, to try to do that. Yeah. Thanks. And how about a talk to Ethan? Because I have to admit, I've read it many times, but this made absolutely no sense for me. Can you elaborate on what, what it's about? Ethan. Sorry, yeah, I kept missing the mute button. I'm um, sure. I think um, I think one mistake I was making when analyzing it was I was not um, I was assuming that the um, I was not assuming that someone was adding uh, more than one input. Um, but I think that the attack still works. Um, but I'm going to um, modify it a little bit. Um, so the idea is that uh, rather than deal with lots of this, rather than deal with arbitrary precision, you fix precision. Um, but since you fix precision, um, you have cases in which, um, uh, for example, uh, here, here's a really trivial case. Um, imagine that you fix precision to be only one or two bitcoins. Um, well, if you have, um, if all your outputs are, um, are odd, then you know that, uh, every single, um, one of those outputs must at least map to one of the, the one inputs, because to be an odd number, it must have one if you're drawing from the set of one to two. So if you have like a very small number of inputs that are similar, you can make these uh, inferences that allow you to sort of shortcut trying every single possibility. Okay, I, I will really send this and definitely understand. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. then so let's would... say you limit your set to be... Um, uh, the number is one through five. So you can only have inputs of the numbers one through five. Um, and you're looking at an output. Um, and the output is an odd number. Okay. Then that must mean that the input set of that output must contain either one, three, or five. It must contain at least one odd number, because two even number even numbers added together should never result in an odd number. But does that still hold up if under the in the context of having an arbitrary number of outputs? 
he, let's see, um, if you split it, no, that doesn't hold up in having an arbitrary number of outputs because um, you would uh, split the, um, you would split, you could split an uh, even number into two outputs. Yeah, so I think I was thinking about the, um, I think when I was thinking about uh, coin fusion, I was thinking it was more like um, some of the previous approaches where you have like uh, um, inputs to outputs. Um, like you, you, you're not like splitting the inputs and you're not splitting the outputs. So um, I can tell you what you were thinking of. <laughs> so the e example that I, I, I did there was, was exactly that 10 inputs, uh, 10 users, everyone with 10 inputs and exactly one output. Uh, that was the example. So that's, that's why you... Yes, yeah, so, so if, if you know how many users participate and how many inputs a user participate with or how many outputs a user create, then that would, that, that, that gives, gives assumptions like this, gives, uh, gives more, more power for assumptions like this. It's, uh, it's actually pretty genius, yeah. <laughs> And the, the, the Tumblr might might know those values, right? Well, it might know how many users there are. Um, and actually, so I, I asked this before, but I've, I've forgotten the answer. Um, uh, does the Tumblr know that a particular user created, not, does the Tumblr know that a user exists that created three outputs? They might not know which outputs those are, and they might not know which user created those outputs, but do they know that there is a group of three outputs that are, are the server. Um, no, the server doesn't know. The, the server does not know how many how many inputs or outputs each player brought. I mean, every obviously everyone sees the completed transaction and knows the total inputs and outputs of the entire transaction, but n not even the server knows like that Alice brought seven inputs and three out and three outputs or something. But the so like I would um, the server might not know that Alice did three inputs and seven outputs, but the server might know that someone created seven outputs. No, they but they don't though. All right, this is because the various components are not linkable, right? Each is submitted on a separate channel. The server has twenty three component commitments from every user but those commitments don't tell them much and the input and the input components and the output components and the blank commitments are both uh, registered in different or streams or in, in, not not as one so so there there is there might be something in a blaming phase but but other than that no, nothing so it's a Tor circuit per input right. and a Tor circuit per output? Yeah, exactly. It's a Tor circuit per component. And then during the blame phase, there's just basically one um, one component gets checked, and then, then the round like reduces the number of players for, the, the one, for that one person. All right. So my very last question of the day, and then I let other people to talk to. Um, so, are you guys familiar with Sharecoin? Blockchain Info was 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 creating that in 2013, which was unequal inputs and unequal outputs. That, of course, the Blockchain Info server know everything, but uh, regardless. Um, Christoph Atlas was able to do some coin join Sudoku. And so what was the problem with shared coin? Well, the problem there is that linear programming, Sudoku is a, a special case of, of linear programming. So uh, that, that was able to solve it uh, very efficiently and in practice in many of the cases because uh, typically, users would have one input and one output. That doesn't make sense. If you have one input and one output, then you can 
you can do you can just look at the transaction uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, one uh, I think they had uh, like in, in the typical case one input and an output and a change output uh, my bad <laughs> oh okay yeah oh yes because uh, I was actually using shared coin <laughs> when I was using it I had to I always sent the money with shared coin I never mixed to myself yeah it's uh, indeed how, how does SharePoint work? Is that is it similar? Like there's a server like Wasabi? No, so it doesn't work. It worked for a couple of years, but it got shut down. Uh, it's blockchain info, right? It's a web wallet. And uh, blockchain... So I remember that. trustless. You couldn't lose your money, but there were no privacy guarantees because the server did everything. All right, uh, Aviv, Igor, Max, Olga, Rafael. Oh, we have a lot of people here. Uh, yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys feel free to join in and ask questions or topics I didn't wrote up. I sort of wanted to, I guess, you know, uh, ask a few questions to Jonald, but uh, I'd rather, if someone who hasn't spoken yet wants to ask first, go ahead. Okay, I guess I will go ahead. Um, so I just want to get a better understanding of the larger picture of how cash fusion was intended to work in, in, in practice. Um, so uh, j just, a, just a few questions and ho hopefully you can answer them. So typically users show up with uh, more inputs than outputs, right? The idea is to fuse inputs into outputs. So that was the original idea, but it sort of evolved to now it's kind of like a, a, a general purpose, many to many uh, coin join. So some, uh, some uh, transactions could be fanning in when I say fanning in, I mean there's less outputs than inputs. And some could be fanning out where there's more outputs than inputs. And then within one of those, there could be like Alice could be fanning in and Bob could be fanning out at the in the same fusion. So it's kind of become this like this general purpose thing where each of the wallets has like just a bunch of UTXOs and it just kind of there, there's there's a little bit of randomness where it selects you know, like let's say ten inputs, and then it's just going to decide randomly. You're going to get eight outputs, so you end up doing like a ten to eight, and then in the next round, maybe you're going to go the other way. You're going to start with like five inputs, and you'll get thirteen outputs. So it's kind of a little bit random. I think what we're going to do is try to try to make some like user friendly settings in the wallet so that it. It, it would like fuse a bunch, uh, do a bunch of rounds, and then at the end, it would try to like consolidate them down, so you have less um, less coins. So um, let's say I'm a user, right? I show up with, um, let's say I just withdrew all my uh, Bitcoin cash from the exchange, um, and so now I'm, I'm I'm using this cash fusion system, so it's going to start fanning out, um, and I'm guessing it's also running in the background. Um, if I leave my laptop just awake and I just l let it run, it's going to keep uh, mixing uh, in these different uh, uh, transactions, correct? Yeah, that, that brings up an interesting point, which is like, you know, if you just let it run forever, is it just going <laughs> to eat all your all your money and fees? So so we we think we need some kind of thing where it, it does shut off eventually. Um, and then maybe there's another mode for like, liquidity providers that just want to just you know keep it open all the okay, time well, there's well we, we we can talk about large amounts like 10 bitcoin cash and 100 for example uh where something like this wouldn't wouldn't really matter um although you know you can't run it infinitely um so then i want to spend money um what does that look like am i looking at my uh utxo set and just selecting a bunch of utxos to spend so okay, so you're talking about coin selection after you've already done a bunch of fusions. Um, yes, yes. So I think like 
Ideally, you don't spend all of the coins from a single fusion together because that's sort of it's sort of a sliding scale. Like you know, that the, the absolute best thing is to spend one UTXO because then you're you're leaking zero information, right? And then when you spend at the, at the opposite end of that is if you spend all of the UTXO from a fusion, it just it kind of degrades that fusion uh, for the other players. So maybe there's something where it like warns you. Where it's like, hey, are you sure you want to spend this? It's like it's kind of a lower privacy spend. Um, but on the other hand, we don't want to like prevent people. If you know it's your money, you want to spend it, then you should be able to spend those coins. So the wallet should kind of ideally be smart enough to, yeah, you know, to try to coax the user to to doing it a little more privately, with also having the flexibility of of just letting you spend freely. You Is know, that- and you can you can spend within a coin fusion. Oh, or a cash fusion. Oh, that's, right. that's, that's what I was going to ask next. Yeah. That, that, would, that would sort of like, the only problem with that is that um, you you might have to wait. Like if, if I want to buy something, let's say I want to buy a domain name, so I go on Namecheap, um, I, could, I could like set that up somehow, but then it's got to wait until that fusion happens. So that may or may, depending on the liquidity, like it may... It might be too late, right? Right, and it might be a different tier size, right? The tier size with rather low anonymity set, for example, or, or low number of peers or whatever metric we will use. Um, and, and that just completes faster, right? And then you have something every 10 minutes, uh, yeah. even if it's only 10 different users, that will be all right in the spending case, maybe. I think there's a feature that we want to build eventually, but it, I don't think we're going to do it right away. And I, I don't want to ask too many questions because it'll go on forever. So maybe just a, one more. Um, after I've done my first fusion and I get, let's say, six outputs, um, the next fusion that I get into, uh, does the software limit how many outputs uh, from the past fusion are going to be allowed into the next fusion? What does that look like? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, it's it basically does a random selection so if that's all you have is those six outputs then it would probably use them but i guess ideally it's it's trying to it's trying to be a little bit random so it, you know if you have 100 utxo it might take you know 10 for round one and then a different set uh for round two maybe round two has a few of them but it, um yeah i think it's just it just has to be random Okay, so uh, it, it does become a problem for people with a small UTXO set. Uh, so the, they'll, they'll be like, awesome. maybe the first round is not that private, but then as they as they keep fusing, they'll just they'll get a bigger set of, of more like kind of truly random coins. Got it. Okay, uh, I'll I'll leave it at uh, at that. Thank you so much, uh, Jonald, for answering those questions. Yeah, sorry, I don't have like perfect answers for these things but and how about uh, so we have here developers mathematicians a cryptographer uh, and even a woman uh, so, <laughs> so jonah do you have how dare any- you how dare you say something <laughs> do you have any questions maybe for someone here oh, I'm, just, I'm a little curious uh, how you guys um see some of this stuff like do you see do you see it being ported over to BTC in some form? I I, I think I'm in the well, best well, position. Right I, I I I'm really in doubt here because because it's it's something that you know th- there is something out there that's already working and and it might very well be just just working and sound and it might very well be the actual best privacy solution for bitcoin bitcoin cash doesn't matter but on the other hand um i'm somewhat afraid to well okay let's go 100 percent forward on on a unequal coin joins because there are just so many little things that um I'm I'm not that smart, you know. I'm I'm just a programmer, and uh, I'm I'm not sure I would be able to even believe if there would be one research out there that would 
go through it maybe there would be two so yeah I'm, I'm in doubt because on the one hand I, I want to innovate and on the other hand I just what if I fuck up something and people are relying on this really heavily and that's scary you know so I, I don't know <laughs> I, I, I will say like, like uh, there's some things in the samurai wallet like ricochet and uh, stowaway which I think are also pretty cool that maybe we'll adopt it, you know, in Bitcoin Cash. I think they are stupid. <laughs> well, there's like, there's like, you hear these things about the, the coin join flagging. So, which is pretty stupid, but it's like, maybe, maybe some tools like Ricochet would be good to, you know, to have. Okay. Let's, uh, let's not debate uh, Samurai. Uh, um, privacy Ricochet, feature. Ricochet has a very unique fingerprint on the blockchain. You're just let's, exposing let's not, spending. Okay, let's not. <laughs> I, I, I didn't realize I was a touchy subject, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's just we'll talk about that uh, at a different different time. Uh, so as to your earlier question, are we going to use this? Uh, I will say um, maybe this is a bit different than what, uh, than what Nopar said, which is that uh, uh, we are trying to get inspiration from all ideas, so it's very likely that we will take some subset of the ideas that you've come up with, and and we, we might find a place for them. Um, oh, a very very important interesting thing, uh, Ethan. In Tumblebeat, you were fighting with how to make sure that uh, the Tumblr parameters, the Tumblr is not lying about its parameter. Do you remember? Yeah. And you were coming up with schemes. Actually, Cash Fusion has a pretty cool way to endure that. Um, Hold on, sorry, I missed that. I'm going to mute you for a little bit because. Oh, it doesn't let me mute you. A anyway, could you mute yourself for a little bit? Thank you. So. Cash Fusion has a pretty cool way to, to ensure that the Tumblr parameters are not lies. It's actually in an op return of the coin join, uh, the, the hash of the, the Tumblr parameters. And actually you can extend this, this idea to more generically that every, oh my God, I, I, I don't really remember, but every input has to sign that uh yeah there there is something about that that you might want to look at the issues of cash fusion and and that that could i don't know if that could be used for tumblr but maybe that's, I think that was interesting interesting um i think the, the the biggest parameter that we wanted to um lock in was the time at which the um tumbles occurred um because if uh if you do them um, at a particular set time, um, then if you exclude a bunch of people, it's much more obvious than if you do them like on the fly when you have enough users, you could be like, oh, I wanna target this person. So I've just added a bunch of fake users and now I'm gonna like mix with them. Um, but I think this this protection against like civil attacks where you, uh, where the tumbler is malicious and adds users to create the illusion of privacy is, is really, really hard to solve. And I think taking an approach where you just assume the Tumblr does not do that is probably um, uh, more realistic. Although Tumblebit was attempting to prevent um, those sorts of simple attacks. Yeah, it's another kind of worms here. Uh, <laughs> let's not open this. <laughs> okay, so what, what do you guys have? Or or should we should we close this soon? I, I have to go pretty soon here. So uh, if anyone wants to go, uh, then I, I can leave first. Um, but otherwise, I'm I'm out of here. I also have to jump off in a few minutes. So it was a it was a good call though. And thanks a lot. This was probably the most uh, deepest conversation of the Wasabi Research Club ever. So 
Uh, thank, thank you guys. It, it was really awesome and uh, yeah, this is the highlight of my week lately. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks guys. Bye -bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. It was a good one.